Right. One of the major questions that always worries us when we look at any slide on a daily basis, the cases that come to us is we look at something and we think, is it, uh, is it dysplasia? Is it something else hiding behind the dysplasia or trying to be a pretender or rather being a pretender? Or is it dysplasia itself actually uh, hiding and being in disguise? The way we get over all of those problems is by constantly updating ourselves by listening to others. And that's what we will do. If that's what you're interested in today, just hang on and stay tuned. Yes, good morning, Dr. Manu Smurti and Dr. Divya. Very nice to have you here. So going on with uh, today's program, if you recall, just the other day, we had our anniversary and many of you joined, in fact, around 400 people. It was great and I thank everyone for joining, including the Vedahi Institute of Dental Sciences who brought us the CDE points for the event and the Goa Dental College who got us that very wonderful quiz. And it was great. We had people from 37 countries and it was an amazing turnout. And I am truly grateful to all of you for being there and for being with us. And I did promise that we will bring you the quiz, the answer to the quiz and the outcome of the quiz. So here it is. This was the quiz that happened on that day. There were three rounds. There was pathoglyphics, word up, and pat hunt. So the pathoglyphics was all about how well you know your emojis and how you can translate, well, I don't know, pathology to emojis and back. So these were the uh, 10 that were shared uh, with emojis and you were supposed to figure out what pathology related term they referred to. Then there was this one, which was word up and you had this wonderfully long word that almost, I would say, you know, competes with the longest word in English. And I would read this as a pneumo, ultra microscopic silico volcanoconiosis. So anyway, within this word, you were supposed to see how many other words, how many words are hidden. And then we had pat hunt where you had to look into this picture and find six pathology related terms. And this was the quiz. So, but to get to that, we'll first go to the lecture and hang on, we will come with the answers back to you and with the winner. Coming to today's uh, session, we are talking about oral epithelial dysplasia and master of disguise. The lecture is brought to us by Dr. Roberto Gerber. He is currently a resident of the master's program in stomatopathology at the University of Campinas, Brazil, and a professor of oral pathology at Latin University, Costa Rica. And he has completed his studies from two places, his dentistry from Latin University in Costa Rica, and his specialization in pathology and oral medicine from the University of Valparaiso, Chile. So with that, I am going to play his lecture because, of course, he is not here. It's a recorded lecture because, well, it must be the middle of the night there. So I will just play his lecture. We will listen and we will get back together again. Hello, colleagues. I hope you are all doing well. Uh, greetings from Costa Rica. If you don't know where Costa Rica is, it's located in Central America. It's a very small country. It's actually underneath Mexico and above South America. I am very, very excited to be sharing this case presentation with all of you. And without further ado, let's uh, get into it. So on June 2020, we have this uh, female patient, 22 year old, very healthy, non-smoker, non-drinker. Uh, and her chief complaint, it's a uh, erosive ulcerative lesions, very painful on the border, lat lateral border of the tongue on the right side. Um, she says she's been having these lesions for uh, a year and a half and the, the pain worsens during fun functional movements. What I mean with this is uh, she's actually a, a med student 
and she likes to study. Uh, when she reads, she likes to uh, speak out loud. That's how she studies. And she's very frustrated with this because it's been a year and a half and she's been seeking advice. She, she no, Nobody's been able to help her with this pain, with these lesions. And she's very frustrated because every time she goes and studies and she reads out loud, the pain worsens and it, it prevents her from getting her studies done. Uh, the lesions have not healed since she first notices them. So it's not something that waxes and wanes, that comes and goes. There are lesions that uh, they permanently stay there and they permanently uh, have, have pain. They're symptomatic. So this is her tongue. This is the right uh, lateral border of the tongue. And as you can see, we have a, a primary ulcer right here with like fine uh, stri radiating from the ulcer. And we have a smaller ulcer here, very painful. Both of those ulcers are very painful for her, but we also see what looks like stri, white stri, that we get, we can think of the weak ham stri, right? Uh, on this side of the tongue, you can see it over there. On the left side of the tongue, we also see what looks like white stri, right? So this is all the clinical findings we have. The patient, it's, she's very healthy. She's not taking any medication. She, ha she hasn't been diagnosed with any other illness. She's very young. She's, just, she's a non-smoker. She doesn't have any other lesions or signs or symptoms in other parts of the oral mucosa, just right in, in these sides of the tongue. That's it. She doesn't have anything else that could guide us to a possible diagnosis. So right now, I want you to think, taking into consideration all these signs and symptoms, what could be your presumptive diagnosis? So think about it for a minute, and I will give you what we thought at the moment it could be this, uh, this lesion. We might agree, we might not agree. This is what we thought at the moment. Oral lichen planus, uh, planus. Uh, we thought about erosive ulcerative presentation, clinical presentation, with which, which usually is symptomatic, right? So what we did is we indicated topical corticoid uh, therapy for two weeks and we evaluated again the tongue and we actually see some progress. Uh, right here was the main ulcer. Two weeks later, we don't have any ulcer. You know, it's, it's, it's all good, it's, it's fine. It, that, that side is fine, but nonetheless, right over here, uh, the ulcer is, is, is not so much an ulcer, it's more like an erosive lesion that remained. The symptoms, although subsided, she's symptomless right now. She's very happy, but I'm not very happy. We're not very happy because the an erosive lesion still remains. So we indicated, uh, we indicated two more weeks of corticoid therapy and we reassessed again. The erosive lesion remained. To the next uh, uh, appointment, the lesion was still there. Okay, so based on these findings, an excisional biopsy was carried out by the dentist in charge of the patient. So the dentist, in, the head dentist of, of her that you know was you know, had years seeing her, seeing this patient. He said, no, I'm gonna take the biopsy, I'm, I'm gonna do the biopsy. We, we recommended the biopsy, we usually take biopsies at our clinic, but he said, I wanna take it. And that's fine, we let him take the, the biopsy. Right here, you can see where the main change is with where the erosive lesion still remains, right there, right? So the biopsy was indicated for that site specifically. And these are the histopathological findings. We have a non-carotinized stratified squamous epithelium. What looked to us with mainly architectural changes. I mean, there's there's no there's no evident dysplasia, right? But we can see, or, or at least we thought we saw architectural changes, epithelial architectural changes, very important. So here is the epithelium. Here is the connective tissue. Right down here we have salivary gland tissue. Uh, we might see like a mild uh, 
uh, basal, the, the hyperplasia, the stratum basal hyperplasia, right? But we can see there's a little bit of disorganization of that architecture on the epithelium. That's the first thing that we noticed. And if we get closer at higher magnification, what we start seeing is a little bit wider red ridges. I'm going to mark them right here. Still with a little bit of architectural changes, uh, we start seeing also a little bit of uh, hyperchromatism, like the, the nucleus of the cells are a little bit more stained, uh, darker, darker stained, right? If we also get closer, we start seeing what looks like mitosis right here and uh, the basal hy hyperplasia, the, the basal stratum hyperplasia. On this particular side, we start seeing a lot of mitosis, right? I'm going to circle them for you right here. We see one. Um, where are the other ones? We see another one right here, another one right here, right here. We see uh, an increment on the index of mitosis on this side, and we are on high power, right? We also see infiltration of lymphocytes, chronic inflammatory cells, lymphocytes into the epithelium, and we also see apoptotic cells. We also see um, epithelial apop apoptotic cells there. So th this is uh, drawing our attention. And all these changes, I mean, uh, once again, dysplasia is not so evident. And we usually think about dysplasia, seeing difference between cells, nucleus bigger than others. Although we see a little bit of that here. If, if you take a look right here on this nucleus, if you take into consideration those two nucle nucleus, nuclei, uh, you can see they're different right they're different in size but it's, it's not that evident but we took into consideration the architectural changes too that we are seeing the irregular on architectural changes red ridges stratum uh, changes and the um the mitosis and taking all this into consideration we rendered the diagnosis of mild epithelial dysplasia Okay, so the patient, as I told you, she's a med student. She was a little bit scared with this diagnosis. She didn't like it. So she asked if she could have the, the biopsy, the block uh, where the specimen is, because she wanted to take it to her patholo pathology professor. Her pathology professor works at a very re renowned uh, hospital here in Costa Rica. And he's a very well-renowned pathologist. They did all these tests. In situ hybrid, hybridization for HPV, it, they, it, it was negative, the results. They did immunohistochemistry for CHI-67, which tries to tell the index of prol proliferation. The higher the index of CHI-67, the more proliferative the epithelium or the, or the cells are, right? He was very low. He, was, he wasn't concerned at all, the pathologist at the hospital. They did uh, immunohistochemistry for P16 to see if, uh, once again if the HPV, uh, human papilloma virus, could be involved. And it was negative also. And they did also uh, hematoxylin eosin, which is the normal stains for assessment at the microscope for pathology. They said you know, it, they didn't see any dysplasia. They said it was most likely to be oral lichen planus, although we didn't see much characteristics of oral lichen planus. Uh, we have to take into consideration that the patient was in corticoid, topical corticoid therapy that could disguise the oral lichen planus characteristics that we want to see at the microscope. So I, I honestly felt really bad because I, th I said, you know, it's a big mistake to diagnose dysplasia where there's no dysplasia. And I'm talking about a pathologist of a very renowned hospital, very renowned uh, pathologist that has way more experience than me. I felt really bad. I felt really bad about my misdiagnosis at the time. And we took it, we took the patient as a orally, she had oral lichen planus. We, be, we went back or just oral lichen planus. The patient stayed under checkup appointments, thankfully, and she stayed with us. 
that's that's perfect that's very good uh, because we are very meticulous on uh, taking pictures and every appointment uh, comparing you know guiding the patient and all of that what we see here it's a comparison picture from June 2020 that's the first appointment that uh, that I saw the patient to November 2021 right and what I want you to pay attention to is that here is the erosive lesion that remained and here, once again, we have an erosive lesion right on exactly the same site. So when we compare these two pictures, we came into the conclusion that the dentist that took the first biopsy, he didn't take the biopsy from the lesion, straight from the lesion. He probably missed the place. He probably took it from another spot. Maybe he didn't see the erosion. I don't know. Sometimes when we... Uh, we, we, we inject anesthesia to the area it gets a little bit ischemic it gets the the tissue gets whitened a little bit because of the vasoconstriction the, the constriction of the blood vessels uh maybe that can disguise a little bit the the lesion and maybe he had a little bit of trouble taking the the biopsy but with these two pictures we can uh tell for sure that the lesion is still there and that the first biopsy missed the lesion. So I talked to the patient, we talked to the patient and, and we told her, you know, we are comparing these two uh, pictures. We think that the first biopsy didn't take out the erosive lesion. So, you know, we think we're dealing with lichen planus, with what the pathology says, with the clinical presentation. We kind of see white stri right there, right? Uh, and it's not responding so well to corticoid therapy. What about we do another biopsy? I mean, we take that lesion out surgically, uh, trying to make us a, 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 make it like a treatment. You know, take take the erosive lesion out, uh, suture, and see if that ends up this lesion. Because the patient, when she's not on corticoid therapy, the lesion is painful, and she's still very very disappointed very, very stressed uh, and very annoyed by this lesion. So we, propo we propose to her, let's do a surgical treatment, let's take it out with uh, safe margins and see if this heals completely this, the site uh, so you become symptomless and you can go on with your life uh, pain-free. And she agreed, she agreed. So uh, we called a oral maxillofacial surgeon uh, to do this biopsy because we need precision. Uh, we use the Velscope. Velscope, it emits a specific kind of light that if there is dysplasia, it kind of marks where, where the dysplasia is. We're still not thinking there's dysplasia. We're still thinking it's just like in planos, but we like to take uh, a little bit of precaution, right? Uh, especially because the the results are not very are not specific. Uh, the, the the first biopsy it didn't tell us it it was uh, it, it didn't have the characteristic of lichen planus planus right. Although the pathologist rendered that diagnosis and we took it into consideration. Anyhow, uh, the velscope it marked a wider area right here, so we did want to mark a safe margin right here. And thankfully we did, because you're going to see the, the rest of the story right now. All right, so that's the, the surgery, that's the biopsy, the sutures, look at how nicely it came out. I know sometimes we're a little bit scared of doing a, a, a biopsy with the tissue we need, you know, with, with the, amount, the size of tissue we need. Sometimes we, we don't want to hurt the patient. You want to take a little bit of biopsy, just it doesn't hurt too much. It doesn't scar too bad, uh, but that doesn't help the pathologist. If you take a very small biopsy, sometimes we cannot do anything with that little amount of tissue. We need a, we need a white bio biopsy. So look at how nice it 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 uh, sealed. This is the specimen. As you can see, there is sort of like a, a fissure, uh, like a cut right there. That's the erosive part. 
the that's the main the, the main erosive part that that she ha was having pain to right here on the serial cuts that we we made you can see right here this is exactly the part where the 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 cut is the the fissure is and you can see it's not an ulcer but it's there there are uh the, the epithelium might be altered so we we are very interested in to see this at the microscope and here is the uh biopsy being studied at the microscope we see a keratinized epithelium we also see there is really no sign of uh of lichen planus infil inflammatory infiltration like a bad like infiltration there is no sign the patient had months with without corticoid therapy so really the corticoids didn't have anything to do with no band-like inflammation uh sub epithelial inflammation chronic inflammation being there we also see a uh, muscle of the tongue all perfect all, nor all normal but the epithelium is not so normal we, we can start seeing that there's acanthosis uh, some red ridges like a drop kind of like red ridges. Let's go deeper into it uh, I mean you can just from here tell that there is dysplasia there is quite a lot of dysplasia There is hyper hyperchromatic nuclei. There is uh, anisonucleosis that which it means that there are nuclei different from other nuclei there is a lot of keratosis as you can see, lots of keratosis. Uh, there is architectural changes. There is this keratosis. Now we have a lot of characteristics that tell us that there is actually dysplasia. But wait a minute. Right here, I mean, this, this is what we used to call uh, in situ carcinoma. Carcinoma in situ. I don't know how to, how to say it in English. Uh, but right now it's it's we reserve the term just severe dysplasia carcinoma in situ and severe dysplasia is the same <clears throat> right now according to uh the uh, health uh, organization world health organization and you can see the architectural changes i mean there is no order there is no stratum right epithelium stratums there, there's none right you can see even right here that's there's sort of like a cyst like formation there's a lot of disorganization here. So we rendered this as severe epithelial dysplasia. Uh, the patient took the biopsy to the pathologist at the hospital. He said, yeah, this is severe epithelial dysplasia. I felt really bad because of the diagnosis on, a, on such a young patient, such young patient, I felt really bad but a little bit deep inside i was a little a little bit happy for my diagnosis for our diagnosis assessment assessment because we knew that we saw changes at the beginning right and let's just think about it for a minute what if uh the patient didn't kept in under those uh, appointments control appointments right on the checkup appointments. What if she said, well, I have oral leak and planus, planus, uh, the treatment is not working, you know, I'm tired of this, I'm not gonna keep on checkups, I'm just gonna keep on with my life, that's it. Uh, maybe a few months from now, from this last biopsy, maybe a few few months from, from then, she would have de uh, developed oral squamous cell carcinoma. And uh, we know that, that when, when the diagnosis of oral squamous cell carcinoma it's it's being made late the prognostic factor for survival for the patients starts going down so we need to diagnose the earliest even a mild dysplasia and treat that mild dysplasia the best uh, uh the earliest that's the best treatment for these kind of lesions we can't we don't want to wait until it's oral squamous cell carcinoma or until there's metastasis we don't want to wait to that because uh, the survival uh, pr probabilities of survival starts worsen uh with every 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 day it passes all right so two months later after this surgery the patient starts saying i have pain again i have pain again 
we thought it might be pain uh, secondary to the surgery that it can happen, some kind of paresthesia, dysesthesia, some kind, some kind of thing like that. But we start seeing a little bit of keratosis and a little bit of damage. We, see, we start seeing alteration two months later. This wasn't there. We, we did a control like two or three weeks after the surgery, then two weeks later, and it didn't look like that. But two months later, she starts, uh, she starts saying she's, she, she feels pain, and we start seeing these changes. When a tissue is, 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 is getting healed, is being healed, it usually heals for the better. You know, everything looks better every day. Uh, it, it shouldn't get, you know, it, it shouldn't heal and then it starts looking worse two months later. It's, it's not normal. <clears throat> so we took this into consideration, uh, thinking about the uh, severe epithelial dysplasia too. You know, we don't want to take any chances. So we went into another uh, biopsy. And we start seeing more oral dysplasia, but we, we start seeing in this biopsy other, other sorts of, of di different characteristics like this epithelial cell, multinucleated epithelial cell. Besides the architectural changes here, where there is this organization of the stratums of the epithelium, we, sell, we, we see a basal cell hyperplasia, we see uh, metozoid bodies, these two characteristics are now being suggested as co-infection for human papilloma virus or human papilloma virus uh, associated oral epithelial dysplasia. Okay, so now we know at the hospital they did in situ hybridization and it was negative. They did P16 and it was negative, but because they missed the diagnosis of dysplasia then we, we didn't want to take any chances and we did some investigation of our own. So oh, th this is another, another uh, a sample of, of, the, of the biopsy and we, we see this keratosis, we see more dysplasia, we see hyperchromatism, we see disorganization of, of the architecture. There is more dysplasia, there's no missing this. And we did PCR, uh, polymerase chain reaction for human papillomavirus, high-risk genotypes, and number 16, one of the most frequent genotypes, was positive. All of this tissue, uh, we send it to England for, for further assessment. Uh, we're waiting for, for the results. We're waiting for what they can tell us. They're going to do uh, in situ hybridization too, uh, which is a more exact um, uh, test for human papilloma virus involvement in this kind of uh, alterations and dysplasia and oral cancer and, and all that. This patient keeps on their checkups, very, very close checkups. Uh, she's fine right now. Everything is, 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 seems to be going well. There's no pain, there's nothing. We hope it stays that, the, the same for a while. But this is a very interesting case because of the history of, of what all happened. Number one, it's a very particular case because of the age of the patient, uh, the, the non-risk, non-smoker, non-alcoholic, very, very young patient, very healthy patient, uh, as a med student, very smart patient, developing this kind of lesions at a very early uh, stage, uh, very aggressive, very, very aggressive lesion. You saw it on the histopathological slides, very, uh, a lot of dysplasia, a lot of mutations. So I want to talk a little bit of, about oral dysplasia, just, just to uh, refresh a little bit those uh, terms. So the, the epithelium, this is normal epithelium. The epithelium is, is, is very basic. It has a basal stratum, which is composed of these dark stained nuclei. And those are like the mother cells. We, we, we look at them like over here. This, this is a basal uh, a layer of cells. And these are the cells that divide, go into mitosis and divide. One of the daughter cells goes up into the epithelium and starts going up, traveling up in the epithelium until it gets sort of flattened and then it just drops off the epithelium. That's all these uh, cells do, really. They stay together, they protect us from the environment and bacteria uh, and the outer environment. 
and they basically that's all they do you can see it over here how they start getting flattened and then like this one like this very very flat cell they just drop off the epithelium that's all they do but it's a very organized and notice that the cells they look the same one another there's no there's so much difference between one another let's compare it to our patient you can tell don't guide yourself by the color i know the color is a little bit different that can that can change within uh the, the amount of time they they put it on the on the dyes they use for uh uh for, for, for these tissues but you can tell there's a difference in architecture in the red ridges in the in the size of the cells look at this hi hyperkeratosis yeah it, just huge hyperkeratosis Let's see another site. Just look at this. This is just one cell. This is the cytoplasmatic borders, limits. This is the cytoplasm. And this is the nuclei. This is a huge nuclei uh, compared to this other keratinocyte. It, it, they're just different. They're just very, very different, vastly different. That's a little bit of dysplasia for you. And there's a hyperchromatism, which the nuclei are stained, very, very white, very, very uh, strongly stained. And as, as dysplasia develops, it starts uh, making changes in the architecture, not only in the cytological aspect, how they look in the phenotype, how these cells look, but also in the architectural changes. It changes everything and that this is just a severe severe dysplasia almost squamous cell carcinoma so what is the difference between severe dysplasia and oral squamous cell carcinoma well let's talk about a little bit more of dysplasia so oral epithelial dysplasia represents changes in the shape size and functions of the cells allowing alterations in the architecture of the epithelium all driven by mutations, which can eventually lead to oral cancer, squamous cell carcinoma. So what's the difference between oral squamous cell carcinoma and dysplasia? I'm sorry, I'll get that into that a little bit. This is just an example. These are three different patients. They're all female patients. This is 22 years old. This is 40 years old. And this is 33 years old. All very young patients, all patients non-smokers, they're all non-smokers, and all patients that have malignant or uh, uh, with a pro probability of, of malignancy lesions that don't come with with a, a, a oral um, uh, like leukoplakia or erythroplakia, which which come before cancer usually. Like we usually see that we think of malignant or uh, uh, with the potentially malignant disorders, uh, we think of leukoplakia and all of this. Sometimes oral cancer comes without uh, oral malignant uh, disorders or potentially malignant disorders. Sometimes it just develops like this. And you can see here from this erosion, it can develop to this crateriform lesion, which if, if you, um, if you palpate, if, if you run your finger on it, you'll, you'll see a very difference between one another. Here is still soft, it's still soft like, like the tongue is. Right here, you, 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 you feel like a nodule, a little bit harder, a little bit harsh, because right here, there is already invasion. That's the difference between dysplasia and oral squamous cell carcinoma, is the invasion. If, if the cells, the dysplastic cells, if they remain within the epithelium, it's just dysplasia. But if the cells, the, 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 the mutated cells, if they invade the tissue underneath, then it's considered oral squamous cell carcinoma. And right here, there is invasion and you can feel, you can feel the tumor. You can feel that it hardened. And then of course, if, it do, if it's not diagnosed right here, it comes over here, you know, it, it develops into this tumor-like mass, huge tumor-like mass, that this is, I mean, there is no, um, there is no missing the diagnosis. That, that you, you see that picture and you know it's cancer. But here, 
we usually miss the diagnosis. We think it's a traumatic lesion. It's painful. All these three patients, they uh, related pain. They said, "We, I feel pain. I feel pain, right? So from here, you know, it can be misdiagnosed very easily. And this can develop into this. And the more time we let it develop, the 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 worse that I, the, the prognosis for the patient. We don't want that. Or the surgery, you know, we have to take half of the surgery, half of the tongue or the whole tongue, right? On this lesion too, this patient had a, around nine months where she felt that pain and she visited the dentist and the dentist said it was fine, that it was traumatic. Uh, no worries about it, you know, just, just let it, just, it, it just let it sit there, you know? Thankfully, she she kept seeking uh, advice from other dentists on she, until she came to us and we were able to do a, a biopsy and it was oral squamous carcinoma. The patient is alive and well. So yeah, early detection saves lives. And this is just a histopathological representation of oral epithelial dysplasia. All those dysplastic cells are within the epithelium. This is squamous cell carcinoma. You can see how the, these plastic cells, they invade the uh, connective tissue underneath it. And therefore, they can do metastasis. They can go into a lymphatic vessel and go to another region of the body and create a secondary tumor. And that's metastasis. Okay. We have to take into consideration and talk about a little bit about incisional biopsy. When we have a, a huge lesion like this, this is a, a heterogeneous leukoplakia. This is a, a, a potentially malignant disorder. You know, it, this is easy to di it's easier to di diagnose. But we have to take into consideration that when we take an incisional biopsy, when we take just a little part of the, of the tissue, we can have three diagnoses. We can have epithelial dysplasia, or we can have squamous cell carcinoma, or we can have even another diagnosis, a misdiagnosis, or maybe that's not a leukoplakia. Maybe that's another type of, of lesion, you know? So we can have either of those three diagnoses. And this is important for you to understand because of this. All right, so of this lesion, this is a very, very large leukoplakia, heterogeneous leukoplakia with e e e erythroplakia, right, right there. We took three biopsies. From this side, uh, the diagnosis was mild epithelial dysplasia. From this red side, the, this e e e erythematose side, it was severe epithelial dysplasia. But from this side, it was squamous cell carcinoma. We already knew that probably around here we would have squamous cell carcinoma because we felt with our fingers, we felt the difference. There was a tumor-like mass. There was a mass there, which we didn't feel here. You know, here we felt a little bit rubbery, a little bit hardened, but it, it was very different from here. And I wanna talk quickly about this, why? Because let's say the, the dentist taking the biopsy, he wants to take the biopsy because he wants to do it but he's unfamiliar with these characteristics. And he says, you know what? I'm gonna take the biopsy from here. So he takes the biopsy from there and mild epithelial dysplasia is diagnosed. Nothing to worry about, it's just mild. We can take it under control. We can, we can keep it on, on checkup appointments, no worries. While squamous cell carcinoma keeps advancing, keeps growing in there. And maybe if, if we did the biopsy first here, maybe there was no metastasis yet but we did the biopsy here, only there, and we diagnosed mild epithelial dysplasia, the cancer over here kept, kept advancing, kept, kept invading, did metastasis, and now the patient has a poor prognosis, probably will not, will not survive within five years. So that's the very important reason why if we are not sure or on what we are seeing or how to take the biopsy, we should uh, probably De depend on other specialists to help us take the, the biopsy for the patient, for benefit, for merely the benefit of our patients. That's it. It's the patient it, that is important. So 
Any suspicious lesion work in an interdisciplinary manner. We have other specialties, maxillofacial surgeons, uh, special, uh, uh, oral medicine specialists, pathologists. We, we, we can rely on each other. Any lesion of more than two weeks of evolution should generate alert and deserves to be evaluated, definitely. It is recommended that the histopathological study of our oral cavity biopsies be performed by an oral pathologist or a pathologist familiarized with oral epithelial dysplasia. Why? Because oral epithelial dysplasia differs from epithelial dysplasia in other body sites and can be missed as, as on this case. The entire oral cavity should always be examined. If you get a patient with a toothache or he wants whitening on, on his teeth, always assess the whole uh, oral mucosa, the whole tongue, everything, gums, everything. The vast majority of lesions that precede oral cancer are, are asymptomatic, such as leukoplakia. Leukoplakia usually is asymptomatic. Nonetheless, on this, on, on this uh, case I just presented to you, sometimes oral cancer uh, or oral dysplasia, it tells us with pain. So don't be, uh, uh, have suspicious, be suspicious of any lesion that lasts for more than two, three weeks and it's painful and it's small and it is not healing and it's not responding to the treatment, go ahead and do a biopsy. It is of utmost importance that the clinician understands the need to send as much data as possible to the pathologist too. It is not, uh, uh, we need a lot of information, not just the tissue. We need the, the age, uh, the gender, if it's on any medication, if it suffers from any illness or if it has been diagnosed with any pathology, um, <clears throat> the, the characteristics of the lesions, if it's an ulcer, if it's a nodule, if it's uh, you know, a, a papule, if it's a vesicle, uh, the time of duration, symptom, if it's symptomatic or not. We need all that information. Information. If you can take pictures and send them too, that helps a lot. Carrying out a previous study of the area to be biopsied is necessary in order to, to not underdiagnose, as I showed you. We cannot underdiagnose any patient. We need to evaluate that lesion very, very well. If a lesion is not responding positively to the indicated treatment, it is necessary to reassess the diagnosis and take into consideration other diagnostic possibilities. When taking a biopsy, try not to damage the sample. Usually, uh, surgeons or dentists that want to take a biopsy, they mishandle it. They, they treat it badly with, with, uh, with the instruments and they damage it. Uh, if, if it gets damaged, the architecture and tissue remains, uh, no, actually, we need the architecture and tissue to remain as intact as possible for histopathological evaluation. If it's very damaged, we cannot uh, assess almost anything. A small sample taken from the wrong area or destroyed by poor surgical handling can lead to wrong diagnosis or make it impossible for path the pathologist to make a definitive diagnosis. Sometimes we have to render insufficient sample. You know, it's not of any of any help for the patient or the clinician. Let's take a, the best biopsy for the patient. And thank you so much for your for your attention. I am very very happy to be sharing these cases with you and this little bit of information for you to take into consideration for your patients to work in an inter interdisciplinary manner for uh, for the best outcome and the best diagnosis for our patients. Thank you very much. Bye. That was indeed a very interesting lecture. And uh, yes, sadly, he is not with us. But I will bring in your uh, questions on the screen so that subsequently he will be able to answer them. So you can look for the replies in the comments that will come on the uh, video. So Dr. Garima is asking which system of dysplasia is being used of grading. And Dr. Selvi had two questions, the answer for which she heard one, as the fact that HPV-16 is uh, testing was done and it was positive. But there's a question as to was trauma from the lingual cusps ruled out? 
and uh, Dr. Kumudra, thank you so much from Myanmar. How nice. I would like to hear your opinion on usefulness of Wellscope in early detection of oral cancer. So we will ask him to answer. I have not used Wellscope really, except for just testing it out. And uh, Dr. Murali, what a lovely lecture. Any postgraduate would love the hierarchy crafted presentation. Wonderful doc. Okay. Yes, it was actually, you know, it would, you would be surprised. I have actually never met Dr. Gerber as yet, Dr. Gerber, sorry, except for, uh, we have just chatted on WhatsApp, but he was very highly recommended by a number of people. And I think I can now understand exactly why I think he's one of those people who's a natural teacher. He was an excellent way of presentation. It was not just the content, which was great, but the way it was done also, which was definitely something worth watching. It was really great. And yes, Dr. Yolandi, thank you. Yes. Dr. Afrin, it was indeed a great presentation. Thank you. And Dr. Yamuna Devi, great clarity on the topic, Doc. Yes. He did actually very much so. That was a very nice presentation. And I'm going to request all of you, since you liked it, please remember to hit the like so he knows that you liked it. And now to go on, if there is anyone wants, besides questions, anyone wants to add any um, thoughts to this also is perfectly fine. And... Uh, I guess that's it. So let me just add his uh, certificate. Yes. So thank you, Dr. Roberto. And we do hope that in some future date, you will be with us on a live discussion. And uh, sorry. We have one comment from Dr. Vivek. It's a simple case with extraordinary findings. Only an expert can show the way. Thank you, sir. And Mabe. you're most welcome, Dr. Vivek. He did a really great job. Yes. Okay. Now, with uh, let's get ahead and we will try and finish before 12. <laughs> okay. So, right. And continuing with this request I have had from all of you is please make uh, some amount of contribution if it is possible for you. Uh, it doesn't have to be a big amount, a small amount, if done every week, can help support this because well, I have been supporting this for the last two years entirely on my own because um, I'm not attached to an institution. No institution is bearing the cost of all this or for that matter, my time. But that is fine. Still, I need to really be able to expand to get in more people involved and I cannot ask others to work for free so <laughs> it will be nice if I can involve more people and we can expand this further it's very easy at the moment if you can just any any of the live streams you like there is a super chat below you will even be able to share this cute little kind of a sticker so anyway if you can uh, make some contribution at the small whatever I, either on the live streams or on any of the videos that you like it will be great and uh, it will help and then as you know uh, promoting a science promoting a discipline is not just about learning because we are not only just learning by ourselves so uh, it is always important to be able to share the great work that everyone has done the international conference, the case presentation conference was always meant so that we can showcase the great work oral pathologists from around the world are doing. That was the first part. Uh, and then this year it was to show the great work that oral pathology and oral medicine specialists from around the world are doing. Then we didn't stop there. We have also made a souvenir and uh, you can look for the souvenir on our uh, sorry on our website if you go to oralpathology360.com and the conferences then you will see 
the IODC PC 2022. And in that, if you click the presentations, it brings you here. And right on top is the souvenir. You can full page it. And yes, this is the souvenir that has been there. It was released during the uh, anniversary event, but I thought I will share it with you all again. So it has a little bit, of course, about Oral Pathology 360 and the things we have been able to achieve thanks to all of you helping all the time. Also is our calendar of events. Also, please note that all the links in this book are actually active. So if you click on a link, it will take you to the set page or link. Then we have included the uh, great colleagues who made this possible. Uh, so many institutions, uh, as you can see the list here, nationally, internationally, plus the International Association of Oral Pathology and the Asian Society of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology were also partners in this that really made a difference. Uh, the event was attended by 200 people and it was subsequently also watched for monumental number of hours because basically it was available for a month subsequent to the event. And we broke some standards, uh, what I would say industry standards because it was watched more than eight, no, about 10% or so more than the industry average of such events. So it was an all in all great success. Thanks to every one of you. So the contents is of course, uh, all the, all the abstracts of all the, the keynotes, the guest lectures, the presentations with some pictures. We also have had uh, some uh, sponsors. So please take the time to visit their websites. As you can see, this is a clickable link. It will take you to Colgate's site. To ensure that we continue to get some support always, please visit their website from there. So these were the two uh, keynotes with one, one picture from each uh, lecture. And then there were the guest lectures. These three lectures were already also posted on the channel. So you can actually watch those videos right from here, from within the book. And then we have the abstracts of all the guest lectures. And we have the, uh, these are the uh, case presentations, the oral case presentations with some pictures from each case and some relevant videos from the channel, which sort of linked into what the topic was. And it is also there for the, right. And here are the credits. Uh, the entire organizing team, I have to say, helped by going through all the abstracts. But I had some really extensive help from Professor Joss, from Dr. Hieronima, from Dr. Ravikant, who helped me with the abstracts to get them into a printable format. And we also had designers that helped us. And of course, there's a special thanks to everybody who made it possible. All the partners, everyone who took part, the chairpersons, the moderators, the attendees, and the sponsors. And a very, very big thank you to Dr. Dinesh Daftari for his support in getting us the sponsors. And yes, we have some pictures and that's the end of that. I do hope you will go. I will also put the link in this, uh, in the description of this lecture now and let's go back to the stream and yes the answers the quiz answers i'm sure you're waiting to hear this so these i mean i would frankly i would not have got all of those so yes the first one was hand foot and mouth disease the next one is lava flowing over boulders screwdriver incisors herringbone pattern i think that was fairly easy swarm of bees was easy salt and pepper appearance, hair on end, snail track lesions, locked jaw, and geographic tongue. And the deal was that the person who gets the first 10 correct, then the answers of the next will be checked and the maximum number of words. And I would have never imagined there were so many words in this, but that is the number of words. Now I'm not going to try and read that. I'm sure you can come back to this page, to this part of the video and watch it again. And these were the six words in the path hunt. 
and uh, yes now now the winner we have to go to the winner so who was the winner <laughs> That was the winner, Dr. Yamuna Devi. And I am pleased as punch. She is one of my ex-students. Ex uh, I have to say I have nothing to do with how good she is, but I still feel great about it. Okay, I guess that's one of those teacherly things that doesn't go away. And coming back, we are almost at the end. So please remember, like, comment, share, do whatever the maximum amount of activity on the channel, on the topics, really keeps bringing oral pathology higher on the ranking of the search engines and that helps. And next week we have a live stream. Uh, I know this was also live, sort of, but an actual live stream, Dr. Uma Devi will be with us. Concepts and research, she's going to have a two part lecture, but next week will be the first part. And subsequently after a few weeks will be the second part. I do hope you will join us. Now, let me see if I have missed any comments anywhere. No. Okay. Everything seems fine. And with that, I got to say thank you. Have a wonderful week. And I will see you all next week. Hopefully, do join us for another event. Mm -hmm.